afternoon session, we were talking prior to this that probably the worst session than the one after lunch is the one before happy hour. So, <laughs> so thanks for pulling, pulling in and coming in. I'll, I'll make note, just housekeeping, that the noise outside um, is intentional. Uh, I think it's been turned down quite a bit, but it's actually an art display. Um, so I think the, the last panel was taken a little bit off guard by it. Uh, so I just want to let everyone know that it's supposed to be there. Don't turn around. No one can turn it down. It's there. Uh, but welcome to our panel. My name is Jason Anderson, President and CEO of Cleantech San Diego. As the name says, I'm from San Diego. Uh, for those fellow Austinites in the room, just to give myself a little bit of credibility, I'm actually from Austin. Uh, lived here for a number of years, worked at the Capitol. And when all the Californians were moving to Austin, I decided to move to California. Uh, so hopefully I balanced out that trend to some degree. Uh, but I've been in San Diego now for about 12 years. Uh, after going to school here in Austin and spending time working here in Austin. So the title of our, our conversation today is Collaboration Making Cities Smarter. Um, but we decided to call it A Tale of Two Cities, San Diego and Chula Vista. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. Um, but I just wanted to begin our presentation by providing a little bit of backdrop of what's happening in, in San Diego and in Chula Vista, really the greater San Diego region. Um, I would assume most of you know where San Diego is. Uh, Dennis, no offense, some of you probably don't know where Chula Vista is. Um, it's the second largest city in San Diego County, just south of, of San Diego, the city of San Diego, uh, and just north of the border of Mexico. Uh, one of the fastest growing regions in the state of California, home to an Olympic Training Center and a lot of other great things that Dennis will talk about. Uh, but the two cities uh, combined are, are the majority of the population in the greater San Diego. So as I said, I'm with Cleantech San Diego. We are a trade association that was formed around nine, almost 10 years ago to really accelerate the development and deployment of renewable and clean technologies in the greater San Diego region. Fortunately for us, some, of, some people may say unfortunately for us, but I would say fortunately for us in California, uh, we sit in a state uh, with a pretty progressive regulatory uh, infrastructure that really supports the development and adoption of renewable energy. Um, our, our utilities are required to meet certain renewable energy, go energy goals. The governor has set very strong and ambitious goals around re renewable energy and energy storage and electric vehicles. And that in and of itself has created this marketplace that we really benefit from in the state of California and also in San Diego. When the organization was first started, like I said, nine years ago, we counted about 125 companies that were operating in the space in San Diego. Uh, that number is well up to close to 1,000 today. Um, and again, it's because of a lot of what's happening around the universities, around the utility, um, and within our state and regulatory uh, scheme that the state has. Already lost the clicker, here we go. Um, <laughs> so let me, before, uh, before starting, uh, let me introduce our panelists, and I'm going to make a few remarks, and then I'll turn it over um, to the, the fine folks sitting at the table. So Cody Hooven is joining us today. Cody is the Sustainability Manager for the City of San Diego. I'm actually going to read a brief bio. I know they were in the programs, but they're not in the program in your hands, so just so you know who's up here. Um, Cody coordinates sustainability policy and planning for the eighth largest city in the country, San Diego. Uh, she and her role is exploring how transportation, green buildings, renewable energy, and climate resilience are included in the, the city's approach to sustainable communities. Her role also includes engaging businesses and win-win solutions around sustainability for the, for the community. She's a founding member of the San Diego Regional Climate Collaborative and a board member of the San Diego Leadership Alliance. Uh, she has a bachelor's from the University of Hawaii uh, and a master's from UCSD Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Next to Cody is Dennis Gagungo with the city of Chula Vista. Uh, Dennis joined the city as Chief Sustainability Officer in October of 2015. He leads the city's sustainability programs and smart cities initiatives. His responsibilities include the implementation of a wide range of sustainability policies and programs, including those related to smart city initiatives, energy and renewable, or efficient and renewable energy, smart growth, water conservation, and healthy community initiatives. He also serves as the liaison to the public and other city departments, civic groups, business organizations, and others as it relates to the city of Chula Vista's smart city and environmental, environmental sustainability, sustainability <laughs> initiatives. Last but not least, uh, Rick Azer, uh, Associate Vice President of Smart and Integrated Infrastructure with Black and & Beach. Uh, in that role, he is in charge of development for Black & Beach's Smart and Integrated Infrastructure Group. Uh, as all of you know, you heard from Jennifer, I think you were in this, uh, the last discussion in this room, 
Uh, Black & Beach is a global engineering and construction company focused on critical human infrastructure, uh, energy, water, and telecommunications. Rick's team is focused on the convergence of physical infrastructure, communication networks, and data analytics uh, to infuse intelligent into system, intelligence into systems in smart cities. And I think we should coin, I thought of this, I saw it recently, but we were talking about a lot about in the, the last uh, session about data. Uh, and I read somewhere recently that data is the new bacon. <laughs> uh, uh, Rick in his role at Black and Beach is an active member of FinTech San Diego. Uh, he is on our board and on our executive committee. Uh, and in his role and with his team, works closely with the cities of San Diego, Chula Vista, and the Port of San Diego on a multiple number of smart cities and climate action initiatives. That is our esteemed panel. Please give them a round of applause if you will. So before I turn it over to Cody, who's going to talk first, I just want to brag on San Diego. We're sitting in Austin. Uh, I worked in Austin. I lived in Austin. Um, but there's a lot of great things that are happening outside of Austin for those of you that live here. And a lot of those really great things as they relate to smart cities, as they relate to environmental sustainability are happening in the San Diego region. Uh, I just threw some fun facts up here on the slide for you to take a look at. Uh, we are number two in the nation in solar installations. We have almost 20,000 electric vehicles on the road. Uh, we're increasing our, the number of electric public charging stations to support those, inter, those uh, vehicles. Uh, we have almost 300 energy storage projects in the region. The region as a whole has retrofitted 75,000 streetlights to LEDs. Um, and we, were, we are receiving a significant amount of funding from a Proposition 39, which is to support energy efficiency upgrades um, at our K-12 schools. We're one of the top cities in the world aiming towards 100% clean energy. Cody will be discussing that. Uh, we're number four in the nation for clean tech leadership. Uh, UCSD, uh, University of California, San Diego, is home to one of the most world, or one of the world's most renowned microgrids. They generate about 92% of their own electricity <coughs> on campus. Um, hopefully all of you have seen it, and if you haven't, you shouldn't, you should. But San Diego is the only U.S. city to be profiled as one of National Geographic's smartest cities. Uh, there's a documentary out there on that that really talks about all the great things that are happening uh, in San Diego, not necessarily just from a smart city's perspective as we would all define it, but also talking about the quality of life, um, <clears throat> the educational systems, um, our ability to produce really great craft beers, um, a number of different things. A lot of those things are featured in the National Geographic's documentary, so I, I recommend you watch, you watch that. We also have the largest concentration of military personnel in the world, uh, and when it comes to energy, that's significant. Uh, as we all know, the military is a significant user and consumer of electricity, uh, and their ability to change things as it relates to renewable energy and energy independence and security is pretty significant. Uh, and finally, uh, because of the state of California, with the state of California, uh, our investor-owned utility is uh, SDG&E, which I know the parent company, the Simper is here today, uh, are required to meet and get 50% of their electricity from renewables by the year 2030. So a lot of great things happening in our region, a lot of great things happening in the state of California. Um, when we look at things happening from a global perspective, whether it be climate talks in Paris uh, or other smart city initiatives being explored throughout the world, uh, I think it's really fortunate for us that the San Diego region, including these two cities, are really seen as a model about how you can bring the public sector, the private sector, and the academic sector together uh, to really start to move the needle on smart cities initiatives. And that's really the focus of this panel today on what these three are going to be talking about. So to kick things off, I'm going to turn it over to Cody Hoobin uh, to talk about uh, what's happening at the city of San Diego perspective. Thanks, Cody. Jason. Um, so. The city of San Diego is within the San Diego County, and one thing we don't have, so we are, it's changing a little bit, but we are a relatively conservative city in a very progressive state. Um, and I would say Austin might be the flip of that, a very progressive city in a conservative state. Within uh, two hours of arriving yesterday, I saw a naked man riding a bicycle. We don't have that. <laughs> so, debatably <laughs> naked, possibly not fully naked. Um, so that was, a nice, no <laughs> that was a nice introduction to Austin for me. Um, so uh, as Jason mentioned, we're the eighth largest city in the country. Um, we have about a million three population in, in the metro area. Um, so our whole county, it's about three million, a little over three million. We're a coastal city. We have a lot of nice attributes. Um, we're a coastal city. We have a big canyon network. Um, we're a major binational region. So our, our border crossing with Tijuana is the busiest, I think, in the world. Um, definitely in the country. And the whole economy sector, Jason covered that, so I'm not really going to go into that. Um, 
we do have a high cost of living. We do have high cost of energy. Um, we have a lot of small businesses, something like 90% small businesses, and, and then this really growing and booming um, clean tech sector. Um, so that's kind of the, the framework, I would say, that we're, we're working with. Um, we recently passed um, a very um, visionary or aggressive, whatever term you'd like to use, uh, climate action plan in December of last year. Um, so it, it sets uh, carbon footprint reduction goals or greenhouse gas reduction goals for our city to reduce our emissions by half by 2035. Um, and that's setting us on a trajectory to reduce at 80% by 2050. So that's a big, um, a big chunk of emissions reductions for us. And that's pretty consistent with um, cities that are doing this in the state of California now because of our statewide um, regulatory framework. Um, so that's the new goals that we've set. Those goals and the actions we see as a way to get there, um, we are setting 100% renewable energy goal. Um, that's electricity um, for us. It's, and it's grid-wide. It's not just city operations, which is what you've seen with some goals like that. It's for our entire jurisdiction. Um, we also have a 50% mode shift goal. So if any of you have been to San Diego, you know what a huge shift that is for us because we are built on our nice freeways and, and love to drive. Um, so, and then a zero waste goal and looking at energy and water efficient buildings um, and climate resiliency as well for us. We're thinking about sea level rise, um, our wildfires are big for us, water supply is um, a key factor for us to consider. Um, which also plays into energy. Um, we are looking to diversify our water supply sources quite a bit. We're very dependent on either the Colorado River or um, the San Francisco Bay Delta. Um, and if we want to generate more water at home, that's a huge energy load for us as well. Um, so some of the cool things that we're working on, I'm not actually sure how long you want me to talk. So I'm just, just keep gonna, talking. Just going to keep going. Some of the cool, fun things we're working on besides that broad climate action plan. Um, so setting all that up, we, you know, we, we used to be a very kind of beachy, under the radar town, especially overshadowed by LA. So we're definitely um, diving full, all, all in <laughs> to this smart city concept and initiative. And we, I like to say when I do some talks, we don't want to just be beautiful, we want to be smart too. Um, so that's where we're headed and we are all in. Um, and so some of the things we're working on recently, we do have a smart street lighting project. Um, we did a demonstration in our downtown area um, and just thinking about, you know, Many of you probably understand this concept already, but for the city, it's a shift of thinking about how do we multi-purpose um, our infrastructure? Like we have all the things that cities own, how can we double dip on those and use them for other things as well? So we have this nice elevated set of infrastructure that we all have um, in the city. So we're looking at how to add sensors to those and expand into just energy efficient lighting, but also what else can we look at from there? Can they pick up noise for crime issues? Can it, can it be sensors for parking and enforcement and things like that? So we did a pilot downtown, um, and we're looking to expand that um, to almost the rest of our streetlights in the city. Um, we're working on this Envision America program as well. It uh, came out of the White House in the city of Charlotte. And um, we're looking at using our streetlights as a template to do a very unsexy sounding project of revamping the way cities procure projects that we can actually keep up with technology. Um, we, if any of you do work in cities, I don't know, does anybody here work in government? <laughs> um, by the time you get excited- You can be and proud and raise your yeah, hand Yeah, be high. proud, be proud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, if, and if you work with cities, you know, by the time we get excited about a, a piece of technology and actually move forward to procure it, it's like version, you know, we're on 1.0 and they're at like 5.0 now. So we're trying to think about how we can do that better and be more nimble. Um, and um, we are also working on um, partnering with not only the private sector, but our university as well. We have several just world-renowned universities, and um, one project where we're trying to pull all these smart city <coughs> concepts together is under this Metro Lab network. Um, that's, again, a White House initiative. There's 26 um, of these hubs around the country where it's a, a local government and university partnership, and they're going to tackle a lot of issues of how <coughs> city challenges and how the universities and their research and their, their um, high-skilled um, folks can help us tackle these projects. Um, one, one last fun, fun issue we're working on. Um, so being the sustainability manager, I'm trying to really merge these concepts under economic development of how we can bring our um, innovative and talented workforce and this clean tech sector to bear on the sustainability challenges that we have to tackle and kind of make that a win-win for everybody. 
Um, so one little way we're doing that is we're planning a hackathon. Um, and cities have done this before, but we're really opening up our, we have an open data initiative. So really trying to open up city data to this hackathon and not just walk away with it when it's done, but kind of cultivate to these concepts that come out of the winning ones, I mean, not all of them, but some of the winning concepts and say, can we help build those and provide a space um, working with clean tech where they can, if it is a viable business opportunity, turn it into a business and the city can actually utilize those to solve some of our challenges and kind of create a nice life cycle of um, technology and sustainability um, in business altogether. So maybe I'll stop there and wait for questions. Yeah. And, some of the things we're doing. Sounds good, thank you, Cody. So next, uh, turn it over to Dennis with the city of Chula Vista, San Diego's southern neighbor. Well, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, thank you for being here. I too have some Austin roots. I used to work for um, Deloitte Consulting, public sector practice just down the street, so it's good to be back. Um, as Jason mentioned, I am the uh, chief sustainability officer for the city of Chula Vista and uh, primarily manage the Environmental Services Conservation Group and also lead the uh, Smart Cities initiatives. Now, it wasn't really clear when Jason asked how many people here have heard of Chula Vista. <laughs> okay, that's, that's not so bad. Right. That's good, that's good. Um, one of the things that- They read the program. <laughs> good job. One of the things that I, that I really enjoy doing when I um, um, sit on panels such as these, especially out of state, is <clears throat> I get to talk about our city. And I get to talk about all of cool things and wonderful things that we're doing. So just a real quick uh, high level of, of about the city of Chula Vista. Chula Vista literally means beautiful view. Um, those of you who have been to Chula Vista, um, actually this should be some pretty cool slides. I mean, it is one of the most scenic places um, on, this, on this planet. As Jason mentioned, it is the second largest city in San Diego County, uh, about 260,000 plus um, population. And um, the, 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 the unique thing about the city is that it has one of the most developable, developable land in, in San Diego County, which is really unique in the sense that we, we have a lot of opportunity going for the city. Uh, Chula Vista, for, for the folks from Boston and up east, we have uh, 3,055 hours of sunshine every year, uh, which is um, absolutely something that we try not to take uh, for, for granted. Uh, we also have uh, one of the only year-round U.S. Uh, Olympic training centers um, set up by the USOC. And we've also been named one of the top smartest cities in the country. Um, Chula Vista basically is really at the forefront of climate change. Uh, we have a proud history of climate change. We've uh, been working over the last 20 years on actions and policies to fight climate change. And we're actually one of the first cities in the country to develop a uh, CO2 reduction plan and one of the first jurisdictions in the country to really assess those uh, issues regarding climate change and begin to plan and develop strategies to address those. Uh, we also did receive the uh, 2015 EPA Climate Leader, Leader, Leader Award for uh, inno Innovative Partnerships. And as Jason mentioned, our mayor was one of the um, 14 mayors from the US to attend the uh, climate talks in Paris, COP21, so it does make us you know, feel very proud to um, have stood there with uh, uh, our partners in the world to um, really showcase that we're serious about climate change. So really talking about smart cities, we, and I say this not to be, not to be uh, flippant about it, but we do also own the ownership of city of the future because of our vision regarding smart cities. And as uh, Rick and some of the folks in the room with Black and Beach will know, um, our city leadership identifies that Chula Vista um, is really trying to position itself to be, a, you know, to be a leader globally in terms of smart cities. And some of the things that we're actually doing is what I will really get into um, some detail and talk to you about. Um, we, we, we have plans to accomplish this vision through a, um, a joint master development plan with the Port of San Diego. We're looking to transform over 530 um, acres of, um, of waterfront property, and we want to develop this as a smart city initiative. Uh, this would be the largest waterfront development in the West Coast, it's actually one of the largest uh, waterfront developments in the country, and is the last real major waterfront development uh, uh, initiative um, uh, in California. It will be implemented in, over four, in four major phases over 24 years. Uh, will include um, future development of 3,000 new hotel rooms, 1,500 new residential units, and seven individual towers. 
uh, a, million, a million square feet of office, retail, and, re um, and uh, retail, office, conference, and retail space. And uh, it will also include 200 acres of parks and open space that will be open to the public and will help to protect the sensitive habitat and our coastal resources. So as I mentioned, this will be a smart waterfront initiative. So we're looking to use innovative technologies to uh, enhance the livability, work workability of the location. And we'll use this as a test bed because it will be isolated. We'll use this as a test bed to look for viable technologies that we could be able to deploy and then eventually scale up and expand citywide. For a project of this size, as those of you who've worked with city governments know that we have to have support because a project of this size really needs all the stakeholders to come together and work together with one objective and one mission, and that is a successful implementation of this initiative. So the project has extremely strong support. Uh, when we kicked it off, we uh, had over 100 community stakeholder meetings because the objective here was to get community ownership to make sure that the folks and the stakeholders who would be impacted by this had a voice and were able to provide some kind of input in towards, towards the direction of where this is going. We received unanimous support from the California Coastal Commission. Those of you who are from California uh, realize that this is no small feat. Um, the term that folks joke about was it was a love fest. Um, very rarely do you get unanimous uh, approval at the, at the Coastal Commission, so we're proud about that. Um, it has been re recognized as a model uh, for sustainable development and has won multiple awards. Uh, the most recent was the American Planning Association National Planning Achievement Award in 2014. So when you have a project of this size that is so revolutionary and so significant, in not just in its complexity and its size, we as Chula Vista also have to have our commitment to sustainability. So what is our, what is our commitment to sustainability uh, with regards to this Smart City Initiative? So the first phase of this project, uh, which is the hotel convention center and the uh, residential commercial space, is to meet the requirements of a settlement agreement. As I mentioned, when we, had, when we conducted these 100 plus meetings with, with the community, the city and the port entered into a settlement agreement uh, with a coalition of environmental groups who are working together as a Bayfront coalition. And we agreed that all the developments in this project would meet, uh, would achieve a 50% reduction in annual energy use, and that each building would perform 15% better than Title 24 requirements in the California Building Energy um, Efficiency Standards. So as a result, we had to start looking at connected buildings, high, high energy uh, efficiency standards, smart grid technologies, and that really started the, 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 the ball rolling in terms of what we were going to do with regards to this smart city initiative. In the earlier panel, I actually heard one of the folks mention that energy is the foundation for a smart city, and, and I was nodding my head because in our case, it really is true, because with the requirement in the settlement agreement with regards to meeting those energy needs, we said, well, we took a step back and said, well, why don't we have an integrated look, um, uh, an integrated approach to this? So we said, well, not just look at energy, let's look at water conservation. Let's also look at communications and architecture. So that really is where we started to come up with this concept uh, of a smart city. We are partnering for success. Uh, we have an all-star team, uh, clean tech, um, is, is, is helping to coordinate an innovation council. The innovation council is helping to advise us on the most viable and some of the best hardware and software technologies that we can, that we can, that we can adopt. Uh, this consists of Qualcomm, Cisco, uh, and OSI Soft. So the purpose of the waterfront, uh, which is crucial because as we try to sell this, part of, part of my job is to sell this project. Part of my job is to really go out there and tell the world about this really exciting initiative that Chula Vista is, is, is embarked on. Uh, it's, really to allow, it's really to allow us to demonstrate viable, smart, and sustainable development practices. Um, as I mentioned, what can we incorporate, you know, everything that's possible about a smart city that we will be able to uh, um, uh, deploy in this, uh, as part of this project? How can we eventually use that, take the lessons learned, and be able to scale those citywide? We're also, we're also looking to showcase the leadership of the city and the port. We're partners in this. The, the port owns the land. Chula Vista owns the project. So we have to work together. 
Um, and of course, we have a host of project partners. We have Cleantech and their membership pool. They have a really deep bench of some of the, um, um, the most innovative firms in the world in terms of clean technology, uh, Black & Veatch, with, um, with their assistance on this project. And then from a public benefit standpoint, as I mentioned, we will have over 200 acres of dedicated new park space. Uh, we'll be looking to protect our sensitive wildlife and habitat on the coast. From an economic benefit standpoint, because the city's bottom line is extremely important, um, this will be a catalyst for economic development. You know, we'll create more than 2,000 permanent jobs, uh, over 7,000 construction jobs uh, when this project is, is, is kicking in. So as I mentioned, we're already in motion. Things are moving. Um, uh, we're, we, uh, we've engaged Black & Veatch um, to do a smart waterfront analysis. Um, this uh, analysis is broken up into three sections. Uh, we have the energy portion, where we're looking at, as I mentioned, energy efficiency, high performance buildings, connected buildings. And then we also have the communications architecture piece, where we're looking at our wireless, our fiber, our broadband technology. And then the final section is really dealing with our smart infrastructure. How do we take what we learned from the first section, which is the energy portion, the communications, and come up with some potential solutions uh, for deployment for smart, smart cities? So I know I've told you a lot in terms of you know, what we're doing, but it's also important that I do communicate. Where are we now? Um, we, as of right now, have completed a baseline development um, and needs discovery phase. We've taken a look at the uh, cybersecurity within the environment. Uh, we've reviewed our existing energy use estimates and then completed an opportunity <coughs> investigation for the um, energy technologies where we, had, we identified 15 to 20 technologies and put them through a, a screening matrix using a variety of criteria um, and came up with, narrowed them down to uh, between, th you know, uh, around five technologies that we think would be feasible within the site. We also looked at estimated cost estimates and essentially how would these uh, technologies be able to be, um, to be deployed. See, even the music, I think, is... <laughs> this is Hang on, music. people, music it's, it's a struggle. Yeah. <laughs> um, from a communication standpoint, uh, we've developed some decision frameworks, and this is hugely important because many cities and many jurisdictions that have gone out there trying to deploy smart cities don't really do this right. And the, 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 the planning is the most important. So these frameworks will help us be able to um, select the best network solutions. We're looking at you know, things like scalability. You know, does this, you know, do, do they provide desired coverage? What kind of uh, future capacity growth can we get? The performance, interoperability, security, uh, O&M. Uh, then we've also, uh, you know, developed frameworks where we could be able to prioritize these solutions. You know, how do we, how do we have a way of being able to, return, to determine um, uh, from a series of many potential options, which is the best way to prioritize and, and, and go in that direction. Um, and then with regards to clean tech, we feel that it's hugely important that we also take advantage of what's in our backyard. Um, so we've conducted surveys. For, 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 for firms in our region and, uh, and, and essentially said, give them an opportunity to tell us what is it that they're doing so that we could be able to uh, um, uh, see where, where we could partner. So that in a nutshell is, is, is where we are and um, are more than willing to provide more detail. Great, thanks Dennis. So as Dennis alluded to and even said, there's a lot of uh, collaboration, there's a lot of opportunity that really comes from cities working with the private sector. Um, and, and we see that very much so in San Diego with companies like Black & Veatch, Cisco, Intel, Qualcomm, OSI Soft, and many others. Um, and, a, and a great partner, I think, in, in at least a number of the institutions and organizations in San Diego is Black & Veatch. And Rick Azer and his team there um, are leading those efforts. So Rick, I want to turn it over to you to, sorry, talk a little bit about Black & Veatch. OK, thanks. Um, I'm trying to talk over the cacophony <laughs> of uh, chaos out here. Um, I think so, that's the theme of this conference is chaos, right? Yeah. So. Well, that's part of, part of what planning is, is bringing order to chaos and you know, really taking control of the adaptive approach of what's out there and using it to your, to your benefit. So I'm, I'm hoping we can use Devo's uh, background to our benefit in some, <laughs> in some manner. Um, so, so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about what we're seeing from, you know, as, as, uh, as a uh, technology company, 
associated with cities and municipalities and how we've sort of taken this um, diverged road from our traditional large project background into smart city and smart city infrastructure type projects. And as, again, uh, alluding back to the, the um, discussion that was, the panel that was just held before lunch, if any of you were here, talking about how smart utility can be a, a um, beginning place for smart cities to emerge from, the, the foundation of energy being so important and then the layering of communications that then allows certain kinds of applications, services, or, or methodologies to, to reside. So, so very close linkages with what's gone on with smart utilities and the smart grid as, as a launching point for smart city. Um, we see this in our industry going through a, a transformation with this trend towards a more decentralized infrastructure, a lot more smaller projects that are then interconnected. So very much qualities that you see in the, the internet of things and in the, in the cloud is really what's going on between the big projects and programs that we traditionally worked on and the emerging that we're seeing both in the energy space and in the, um, the smart city space. And we see this as well with um, uh, corporate and civic uh, campuses and architecture as well where, where different entities are taking their energy destinies into their own hands either because of regulation or, or sustainability objectives or because it becomes an economical way to um, balance cost, certain operational efficiencies, or even um, you know, good ROI benefits that then allow money to be spent in other, in other areas of, of, um, of the city. Um, talked about data being the new bacon. I, I, I had yeah, a thing of um, that's gonna stick. <laughs> small is the new big. And, the, and this trend towards these small projects and as they aggregate up into, into very big things, I think is what we're gonna see more and more of as, as time wears on. And, and a lot of that's gonna shift from utility to, to city and municipal infrastructure. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I talked a little bit, communication technology and then the platforms that that enables is really this um, fabric that ties all of this together. Um, when we look across at what, what cities are facing, we see different levels of urban challenges, of aging infrastructure, and of the desire to leverage new capabilities. And, and a lot of that gets into, um, you know, how do we handle this, this rapid pace of urbanization, this denser concentration of, of people, resource economic activities? How do we improve those areas? And you have a great opportunity with a greenfield 500-30-acre site and 24 years of, of growth plan for there, but a lot of our city is, and cities in general are, are already there, and so how do you begin to layer in um, you know, smart concepts into those cities to make them safer, healthier, more productive places that have um, larger economic benefit? And, and even within Chula Vista, very different economic zones from this um, uh, Bayfront development to uh, to an older city core to uh, the, the 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 growing um, suburbs on the on the edge of town. And each one of those has different requirements that all can benefit from smart connected kinds of infrastructure. Uh, wanted to mention a couple other things. Um, so the, so one other concept I wanted to bring up, you know, we can get into it as we as we talk is just. What are some of the factors going on right now that's leading to smart cities being uh, so relevant today and at this moment? And the, these trends are things that have been developing for some time, but they're, they're sort of uh, converging and coalescing all around this last year or two that's really helped um, explode the concept of um, smart city and, and the, um, the, the, I was gonna say hype, but it's not really hype, but just excitement around what what can happen with these kinds of concepts and spaces. And some of it's very mundane stuff like uh, pervasive wireless data coverage so that the carriers have built out their data networks. We have LTE coverage all around that allows for uh, high speed data transport. Um, the, the transformation of the public carrier plans going from voice to more data rich plans where they're, they're taking advantage and understanding um, 
you know, you know, these kinds of devices and sensors and uh, little things that, that connect and provide bits of data that turn into the analytics and the intelligence that's needed to uh, provide uh, wise city operations. Uh, the miniaturization of those processors, so, so the ability for these small little things to show up on sensors, the long battery lives, to have processors embedded in them that allows for the edge processing that we talked about earlier today so that not all that information has to come back, but plenty of it can that, that provides those uh, rich data streams for, for analysis. Cloud computing in general, where, where there's a place for all this information to go and reside and be structured and then be pulled from to make intelligent decisions. One, one new area here, the rapid pace of um, development of deep machine learning and artificial intelligence. We might be hearing some of that <laughs> out back here. But, but the ability for, for machines to learn on their own and then to share that information. And a lot of people have talked about sort of rise of the machines and what does that mean for uh, cities and industry going forward. It, 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 there's a very evil sounding component of it, but there's also a very beneficial component too of, of the, the, the wiseness that can come to give the kinds of rich information that allow good, good decisions to be made. And then, and then also just um, the rapid improvements of, of visual displays and, and of um, um, analytics to be able to, to, to compile and show this information in a way that's meaningful, that, that allows for that communication to happen and decisions to be made. And then lastly, um, vast improvement to battery life and the possibility of energy harvesting to, to get rid of that last wire. And that, that's, that's the one that's still hanging out there is that power wire and that, that as we, as technology progresses and we're able to look at different ways for devices to maintain their lives and be able to communicate for longer periods of time, it's going to really enable the kinds of uh, um, data collection and communication that will be, be most beneficial for us. So those are, those are some trends I just wanted to kind of highlight and in, 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 in our goal in working with with San Diego and Chula Vista, and with Cleantech San Diego and the region, is really to, to, to one, help and develop these opportunities, to build a reference and a framework for other cities as well. Because I think what, what we'll find here will have broad applicability in other, in other parts of the country and in the world. And, and, and as our company being so broad, we're, we're eager to leverage that across um, um, multiple municipalities. Um, and then lastly, uh, um, one other thing just in terms of approach. So a lot of different approaches for how cities are, are engaging their, their smart city path or journey. You heard a couple of them here. Um, some things that I'd like to point out is, is there's, there are certain, well, everyone's approaching it different. There's certain kind of emerging commonalities. And, and, and one of those is to really find the quick ROI projects. So, Things like uh, streetlight retrofit and connected streetlight, uh, you know, sort of intelligent network connected streetlight services that that can pay for itself over energy savings and of uh, uh, um, um, maintenance savings, operational savings over time, and, and and start to seed the opportunity for more and more smart, smart city projects to happen. So 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 it's quick ROI wins. There's parking wins that can lead to revenue really fast we're looking at different ways to um, network connect parking applications within within municipalities and these high profile kinds of uh, payback projects can can start to add a bunch of support to smart city initiatives and then the other way is to really take that that uh, you know kind of that master plan view in mind too of you know identifying the goals and priorities the stakeholder input the things that that Dennis talked about and, and how important all that is to gather that advocacy and leadership from the cities to help push for, for some of these initiatives that, that can take a while to develop. And so by working both of those angles of, of the quick wins plus the, the visionary strategy can get to a point of um, smart city development that, that, that gains momentum. So with that, I'll, I'll turn back to you. Great. For Thanks, Rick, and thanks for your perspective. I think what is exciting, not only the 
does Black and Veatch kind of bring this worldview to our region, but then they can take what's happening in our region and share that with the world in terms of the work they're doing and the teams um, that they've assembled around the globe. So it's a great opportunity for us in San Diego. Um, we're gonna open it up for questions, uh, but I'll ask a couple to start off with, and Cody, I'm gonna start with you. Rick kind of compared the city of Chula Vista and the city of San Diego in terms of greenfield development versus not greenfield huh. development, right? And you're obviously working on the not side of things right. and working with a city that's pretty well built out, um, you know, not a lot of greenfield development. Um, so how, what, what are the challenges that you see for a city like San Diego where it is pretty much built out, there's not a lot of new construction and where there is new construction, it's kind of in a silo um, about really how, what are the challenges that you see in terms of integrating a lot of these smart types of technologies in a city such as, such as San Diego? Um, so I guess I would say that probably one of our bigger challenges is getting our, us, our staff, to look outward. Um, for years, cities have been really good about looking at their own operations and how we can improve things we do, and really taking a moment when we do our greenhouse gas inventories, realizing, oh, <laughs> the, big, the big bang for the buck would be not our own operations, but actually everybody else's. So that's one thing, is just getting city staff to look outward, and then two is kind of organizing um, across the city that way. So how do we, so one of my challenges I, I noted before you even asked that question was thinking about how we engage the public, we engage the business sector, we engage the residential sector, the multifamily sector. How do we get at all those different groups and help them to try new things um, or capture what they're doing? Um, so I would say that's one, and um, these, we like pilot projects. <laughs> that's a, a great way to kind of get at doing some of these things without waiting for the whole city to change their mind and do something new. So that's one way where we get to work with different partners, cities and um, businesses, often through clean tech, thankfully, um, to try out new things. And once you get a pilot going and people see how that's working, that helps to spread the word. But um, definitely kind of engaging, engaging people is, is really hard. So while we're talking about challenges, you, you alluded to the fact earlier that San Diego is kind of a a relatively conservative area in a, in a relatively uh, non-conservative state. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of the mayor's role behind a progressive climate action plan, you know, really looking at smart city efforts um, and kind of give a backdrop to that in terms of the work you do and the work that the city of San Diego does? Right, I realize that is relative. <laughs> San Diego is relatively conservative. <laughs> um, so yeah, our mayor is a Republican mayor um, and I often lead with that and I guess I forgot today, but. Um, it's pretty exciting for us in California to have a Republican mayor leading this really bold and visionary plan, and um, he's been behind it from, from the planning stages, and now we just adopted that plan. Some of our stakeholders that we all kind of form this coalition as well, they're kind of starting to retreat to their corners and say, oh, we're not really gonna trust that he's gonna implement it the way he, he seemed to commit to passing it. Um, and we're all in, we're, we're implementing as much as we can and he really sees, so does um, our leadership and myself, see this nexus between sustainability and business. And actually it's good for the economy and it's helping us grow and it's something that we're kind of known for locally and at the state level. So it's only benefiting us, it's not an environmental tree hugging initiative, it's a what's good for business, what's good for innovation, um, what grows new businesses, you know, businesses like Black and Beach you know, I'm gonna put words in your mouth, but they're able to actually expand because cities and the regulatory framework um, allow them to test out new ideas because we're, we're creating that environment. So um, our mayor has really kind of owned that perspective um, to let us kind of play in this, in this sandbox a little bit. Great. Um, and thank him and you for that, <laughs> uh, for the leadership. Dennis, from your perspective, when you think about kind of the Bayfront development and some of the development or some of the projects you're doing in, San Diego, or in Chula Vista and you're looking at fiber for the eastern portion of the county to, to uh, deliver service to your growing uh, population out there, what do you see as some of your biggest challenges in that Greenfield perspective versus what maybe Cody has to address in, in her work? Well, the main, the main one would be, and, it's, and we're not too different from most cities, is, is budget constraints. You know, we have competing priorities. And one of the things that we always run into is how do you justify a, 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 an initiative that has, you know, pretty significant upfront capital costs, but the return on investment would probably be multi, multiple years down the line. How do you justify that versus something where there's another department that's saying, hey, we want to implement this today, 
and we'll be able to get a return on investment in, 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 in a year. So that's always a challenge that we're facing. Uh, we also face challenges of you know, not having the, um, the technology in place. Um, you know, that's, you know, a, a smart city initiative is only as, as effective as the underlying infrastructure that you have. So there are certain areas within the city um, that are a little older. There are also other areas that are newer. And you know, just trying to make sure that we have a, an IT infrastructure that's, that's broad enough to be able to support some of these uh, is a challenge. Um, one, one other thing, too, that I, that I would like to mention is because we also do uh, uh, utilize and maximize on the opportunities of pilot programs. And what we found is that there are benefits of having pilot programs, but there's also some unintended consequences of pilot programs because the risk of having these isolated implementations uh, when you, when you want to start having you know, some kind of seamless integration, we, we, we have found um, that that could be restrictive. If you don't bring the scale. Right. right. Yeah. Any questions from the audience as we're talking up here? In the back there. Yeah. Uh, real quick, sorry. Uh, no, you, I'm pointing to you. Uh, uh, if you'll stay. I know, right? Uh, um, well, we can hear you back here coming up. So. Yeah. Uh, if you will, just for the purpose of the panel, state your name and who you're with, please. Yeah, I'm Todd Nate. I'm at Oracle, so we're all the back office type world. Uh, I, I've lived this world here as well, so uh, Smart Cities as well. Actually, was involved in Kansas City's rollout with, uh, with LMR that kind of drove the project. So it, it's, my question is this to the, the panel. When you look at ROI, right, ROI is one of those things that kind of makes it very compelling versus trying to justify the project and sell it on its own merits or whether money's available. You mentioned parking is one of them, right? Um, do, give me an idea from your perspective of what you measure in your world as to what would be those, the, the low hanging fruit from your perspective as to what would be those two, maybe three targets you feel, just from a gut instinct, I'm not looking for hard data if you don't have it, but that would drive that ROI. In other words, for example, a lot of the tollways, for example, are moving into that, in, into the, you know, called tolls or the new tax, right? So as we transition out of the current environment we're in into an obvious new environment, these tollways are hitting, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the airports, the uh, parking, and because that's, they do it already. So in your world, Give me an idea of what you think are those ROIs that would uh, be the primary drivers to justify the, uh, the, the a smart build. So I'm gonna. Dennis, because Dennis used to work for the toll authority in Texas, correct? <laughs> um, I'll let him start that because he can make that parallel. Well, I'm not going to speak to the toll authority. I'll speak to <laughs> what we're doing now. Um, well, the the key thing that we find as far as low hanging fruit is is is, is having data um, that's easily accessible. Um, in real time that allows us you know, to, to, to be able to do some kind of analytics and, 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 and have uh, what we would consider uh, predictive analysis so that we could be more effective and efficient. I mean, as government, we're in the business of providing services. So anything that allows us to be able to do more with less or to do more and be more effective at what we're doing uh, certainly is always at the top of our list. Um, so the data component is, is, is huge. Um, also trying to see, look for ways where we can be able to minimize, you know, human interaction, automating systems. Um, you know, it's no secret that government has, you know, has lagged behind in very, in many instances, very fundamental uh, areas. So from a low hanging fruit is, you know, trying to see what we can do in that area. Um, also, what can we, what do we have in terms of existing infrastructure that has value? Uh, we're, we're partnering closely with the utilities and some of the uh, providers basically to tell them, okay, we may have certain dark fiber that we may be able to get into an agreement with them so that they could be able to use um, some of this dark fiber depending on where they want to expand within the city. And that way we could generate revenue almost in instantaneously. So those are some of the areas that we're looking at. Cody, any, anything to add on that? I think data is a great answer, that if we could just better refine what we know already, that there's savings alone right there. Um, I think we're going to hit a problem where once we hit the low-hanging fruit, the ROI is going to get harder and harder to define. Um, but we need to also broaden our definition of ROI. So right now, it's we're talking about cost per greenhouse gas reduction or something. But you know, what are the other costs? What are the other benefits that we're getting? And as a government, we often have to think about that. What are, what are the benefits we're providing to our citizens? And sometimes we do things that maybe aren't cost effective, like clean air. 
you know, is a benefit that we all kind of expect um, no matter the cost. Um, and then I would go back to my other answer of kind of the multi-purpose concept where um, maybe we're doing one thing that is a high cost, uh, for example, water, um, providing water to citizens, but how can we double dip on that where we're looking at, for example, um, we store a lot of water in reservoirs. Can we do a pump storage project where we store water or pump during the day when there's the most renewables in the grid and then sell that energy back at night and make money and then we, that allows us to provide other services. So thinking more about being creative about kind of double dipping on some of our infrastructure. Rick, any perspective? Yeah, um, so, so two, main, two main areas there. One is um, what kind of operational savings or cost avoidance can come up and, and, and uh, we spoke to that a little bit, but examples of that are, are through you know, network connected smart street lights. So you can have energy, a lot of energy savings you know, by converting from sodium to LED kinds of uh, technologies, you can save 50, 60% of your electrical costs. So that works for the kinds of municipalities that don't own their own power company as well, where they can, they can save on that operational cost and then invest that into other areas of the city. Second, we did talk a little bit about parking, but one of the things that network par parking can uh, allow for is surge pricing and other kinds of methodologies. Also, um, um, when a car leaves, you can sense and reset the meter. You know, so there's there's ways to earn more uh, revenue off of the same space by you know reselling it and also by by dealing with the, the basic capitalistic economies like Uber has of, of when they're more scarce, raise the cost a little bit. So that's has another. It, has the, the Port of San Diego has implemented some similar types of parking um, technologies in, in that regard. Yeah, and you, I mean, you see it when you go downtown on ball game nights and all the garages cost more, well the streets have those kinds of capabilities to, uh, to operate in that manner as well. And this, this communication technology of presence and awareness and time can can make all that happen. Jeff. So my name is Jeff Mochi, I'm with RCR Wireless News. Uh, in our point of view, the uh, smart city is really based upon the smart communication infrastructure. Historically, the mobile phone companies and fiber companies have been at odds with, with respect to municipalities and the perception is municipalities try to make all their money off an incremental light bulb attachment revenue or right away revenue. And, in fact, if they would take a different point of view, it would be an enabling technology that would unleash new services, new revenue opportunities. So my question for the two cities is, have you changed your mindset about the way you treat and engage with uh, new partners like uh, the private companies and the mobile phone companies? Go ahead. Well, Go ahead. That's, a, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that... Um, that our leadership has identified is that they, they clearly understand that a, a, a relationship with the, the providers that is mutually beneficial is the only recipe for true success. Um, so even as we engage with the different, um, different partners, we always look at it from the standpoint of, um, from a partnership standpoint. Um, we, we do realize that you know, one of the key things that we use, that, that is that one of the factors that we would have to consider when you're deploying any uh, smart city initiative is public acceptance. And many of these utilities or many of these providers don't necessarily have that. So that's a hurdle we have to, to overcome. But we do work with them. The example that I gave you earlier about trying to identify existing infrastructure that they may have that we could use or infrastructure that we have that they could use is really a, a good indication as to how we're working closely with them. Uh, we also um, um, also realize that by tying in some of the strategic goals of these providers, tying that in to our economic objective of where the city is going, where are they looking to expand? You know, if AT&T or our local provider is looking to have some significant uh, investment in infrastructure in a certain region of town, well, we seriously have to look at that area as a way where we can maybe piggyback on that and help to grow some of our economic development initiatives. Cody, anything to add? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we have to look at, um, you know, we, we have to fix our potholes, all the, all the infrastructure complaints that you all hear all the time. So a lot of times cities are not 
all the time, I would say, we're not trying to make a buck. We're trying to just pay our bills and provide more services. So um, I think in the past, we actually have given away some good deals um, when times were good or whatever. But now we're getting a little smarter about that as well, that um, we're not trying to make a buck for ourselves. But if we can maximize the benefit here, and um, in economic development, we do a lot of trading where, OK, we'll give an incentive here as long as we see a jobs benefit to the whole over here or something. So we, we do a lot of thinking that way. Um, and I think so we're open to those partnerships and getting a little bit more savvy about how to do that. So it's a win-win. It's a case of going when you swapped out the light poles. You went to a whole new light pole infrastructure. Did you integrate base stations and backhaul and that sort of thing so that you at least had a shell there so that it would enable uh, dislocation of mobile networks or putting in public safety, surveillance, and that type of thing? And that's really phase two of the, the, the yeah. streetlight project in San Diego, right. working with GE and some others, um, is now using that wireless kind of hub that's been created, part of that, right. ne that mesh network downtown. Um, I'm going to go to you. Yeah, no, I, I was just, uh, my question, I think from you guys on that just a little bit. And I know that public private partnerships have kind of been in favor, fallen out of favor, been in favor, fallen out of favor. But I've heard things from all the cities that we represent. We're, we're in about 30 different cities as their city engineer. And we hear this collapse of, hey, we don't have enough capital to do the things we want, and we know are right for our citizens. And I guess the question I would just ask is, there seems to be tremendous pent up capital, and are you guys looking really at partners who would look at you know, 10, 15, and 20 year paybacks as good investments right now, as partners in this, as maybe widely as you could? And I'm just curious to your answers. And, th and that's a great question. So one of the things that we're doing, and we're working with Black & Veatch, is we, we, we initiated a um, fiber assessment study. And a key component of that fiber study is to look at, um, again, you know, what does the city have in terms of infrastructure? But not only that, well, what does it mean if you're going to come to the table and begin trying to negotiate for some of these multi-year long-term uh, agreements? What should that look like? What are some of the things that, as a city, we should make sure that we focus on? Um, and we're finding that to be hugely beneficial because that will be our playbook as we start to engage many of these um, private sector uh, companies. And I think, just real quick, the city of San Diego is doing a very similar study with Black and & Beach and even internally about their fiber and how, what, where, are the, where is their dark fiber and how can they use that right. to, for the economic benefit of the city. Uh, my name is Dahlia Colano. two-part question. Uh, first, how can we get better support from regulators? And the second question would be, how would a city who wants to be them smart, what would, how, how do they start from your thing? <laughs> support Those are really hard questions at the very end of the panel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Support for regulators. From regulators, uh, thinking like utility regulators. Right. Is, yeah. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> We work with them a bit. I think we can better engage them, frankly. I think we often go um, through a middleman, which is our energy utility or whatever, and I think we can better directly engage them and, and educate them on what the, the struggles are that we're working on. Um, you know, the energy market is changing so rapidly. Um, I think if we don't talk directly to them, it's just slowing down that process. So that's, I don't know, one idea I think that we could do better. I forgot the second part of your question. <laughs> I'm gonna answer the second. How do you start? Um, so, so we spent a lot of time thinking about that, and, and part of it is really looking out in the future, like what, what do you want your city to be like in 2050 or say 20 years out, and sort of begin with that end in mind of, of where do you want to get to, and then begin to take inventory of what you have and, and what assets you have that may have value to the private or public sector. Um, seek a lot of stakeholder input. These are things that, that Dennis talked about earlier, so important to, to gain the, the, the advocacy and the momentum that's, that's required. Think big, even though you may start small with pilots, really have that vision to say, you know, what can all this become and, and, and drive, drive towards that almost relentlessly while you study at the pilot level. And then stay, stay true to your vision and be willing to adapt as technology develops. One, one thing that we found is, um, Things are happening so fast that things that you thought were five or six years out are now like next month. And so, so having the ability to 
to, to really, whatever you thought you were going to do in 2050, you're really going to do in about five years time. And so be, be prepared for that. Those, those are some things that come to mind. And I would say as a shameless plug for myself, um, I think uh, when cities have organizations like Clean Tech San Diego or Think Big in Kansas or Clean Techs here in Austin, organizations that can facilitate a lot of these types of activities and the conversation, elevate the conversation, um, I, think that, I think we play a critical role and a crucial role as well um, in kind of working with the different stakeholders, bringing the stakeholders together, being a neutral third party um, to convene uh, folks and have conversations I think is really important as well. So with that, I've been given the ax from the back. Uh, my apologies. Again, I want to apologize for the, the external chaos, uh, but I think we handled it very well, speaking on behalf of the panel here. Thank you all for participating. Please thank the panelists up here. And we'll hang around for a little bit of questions for those of you that didn't get to ask questions. Um, and obviously, we'll be around for the rest of the afternoon. So thank you.